This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Freedom of speech is a cornerstone freedom and a critical prerequisite for religious freedom, political dissent, human rights, and national security. Tyrannical governments around the world understand the importance of free speech and therefore often employ censorship as their first order of business. In the West, we're quickly losing our free speech rights as encroachments seep in from an ever-widening array of Islamic supremacist groups and their leftist allies who think, or claim to think, that freedom from insult, a right which doesn't exist in any human rights document, should trump all other existing rights and freedoms. However, Islamists understand the importance of free speech, and that is why they're working fastidiously to control, manipulate, silence, and ultimately criminalize all speech that sheds a negative light on Islam in a way that's tantamount to Islamic blasphemy laws. At the helm of this push is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC. The OIC is the largest or Muslim organization in the world, considered by some to be a proto-caliphate. It's comprised of 56 UN member states plus the Palestinian Authority, and it's the most powerful voting bloc in the United Nations, and yet, most people never heard of it. The OIC's long-term goals are the establishment of an Islamic caliphate and the worldwide implementation of Sharia law. Toward this end, the OIC seeks to criminalize all speech that's negative about Islam. The OIC consists of some of the most egregious human rights violators in the world. And while the OIC demands respect for Islam and Muslims, it shows no reciprocity for the religious minorities who are systematically persecuted in Sharia-controlled territories. Practices such as the execution of gays, forced marriages of little girls, amputations of those who steal, the imprisonment of political dissidents, gender apartheid, and the jailing, flogging, or death penalty for Islamic blasphemers are all permissible under Sharia law and commonplace in the OIC countries. However, if you criticize or even question any of these practices, then you're defaming Islam, a sin worse than the crimes themselves. In stark contrast to the Western concept of defamation, the OIC's definition of defamation includes all speech that sheds a negative light on Islam or Muslims. Truth is no defense, and opinion is not protected speech. And yet, from 1999 to 2010, the OIC deftly maneuvered to pass numerous UN resolutions to combat defamation of Islam. In 2005, the OIC launched a 10-year program of action, a major component of which was to combat Islamophobia. It emphasized that it was the responsibility of the entire international community to combat defamation of Islam. In the West, we assume that Islamophobia is bigotry or prejudice, but when the OIC says it, it means anything that interferes with its Islamic supremacist aspirations. In effect, the OIC's charge of Islamophobia is equivalent to a blasphemy charge. <coughs> when Wikipedia refused to remove depictions of the Muslim prophet Muhammad from its English language website, that was Islamophobic. It was Islamophobic when Gerrit Wilders said he's in hiding due to death threats from Muslims, even though it's true. And it was Islamophobic when the EU asked Iran to drop the death penalty for the crime of apostasy. More importantly, despite the fact that the jihadists themselves admit that they are motivated by their faith, if you think that they're that you associate any interpretation of Islam with terrorist activities, then you are an Islamophobe. The OIC uses inter international legal instruments, multilateral consensus building, and consultations with European parliaments to advance its anti-Islamophobia agenda. 
Toward this end, the OIC's primary goal was to pass a UN resolution to counter Islamophobia and call on all nation states to enact domestic laws to do the same, including deterrent punishments. In and the OIC is achieving its goals in spades. In 2011, the passage of Resolution 1618 to combat intolerance based on religion or belief and its subsequent implementation process, known as the Istanbul process, paved the way for countries, especially targeting the West, to clamp down on speech deemed Islamophobic. The OIC's desire for blasphemy laws in Europe has also made incredible advancements. Sometimes in cooperation with the OIC and sometimes independently, European countries all now have laws in place that silence and punish statements that are public which defame Islam. The laws go by different names. Sometimes they're called hate speech laws, sometimes denigration of a recognized religion, or public order laws. But they all serve as proxies for Islamic blasphemy laws by deterring speech critical of Islam and punishing it when it occurs. Now many countries in Europe are working to criminalize that speech and not just have it a civil violation. Under the guise of sensitive speech, responsible speech, or politically correct speech, what the OIC really wants to do is to shut you up. The Muslim Brotherhood front groups are also working hard to protect Islam from so-called defamation. Instead of working on the international level, like the OIC, Muslim Brotherhood front groups work on a local level, using grassroots campaigns to achieve the same goals. They operate primarily in the US and Canada, and include the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, the Islamic Society of North America, or ISNA, the Muslim Students Association, and many others. Most are listed in the 1991 explanatory memorandum, which was entered into evidence without objection from the defense during the 2008 Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest terror financing trial in the history of the United States. This memo outlines the Muslim Brotherhood strategy to achieve a civilization jihad in North America where it plans to sabotage the West from within and supplant it with Sharia. These groups have made great strides. For example, in America, under incredible pressure from CARE, corporations like Nike, Liz Claiborne, and others have changed their products, their package designs, and even their internal production procedures to be sensitive to Islam. Prestigious universities, including Georgetown and Harvard, are intentionally indoctrinating students with false information about Sharia and Islamist political goals. Thanks to Karen Empak, Hollywood is now censoring its films to ensure that terrorists are portrayed as anyone except for Muslims. Public speakers are being shut down on campuses, politicians are being skewered for their views on terrorism and refugee policy, and in the US, Intelligence and national security agencies have purged from their training material any mention of the motivating ideology of jihadist groups based on advice from Islamists. Here in Canada, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees free expression to all Canadian citizens. But your liberal politicians seem determined to take it away from you. For example, the Canadian Human Rights Act, which established the Human Rights Commissions, had the noble purpose of ensuring equal rights for all. But Section 13 operated to censor free expression. It read, no person shall publish any statement that is likely to expose a person to hatred based on race or religion. No actual harm had to result. No intent had to be proven. The only requirement was that the communication was likely to expose a person to hatred. So, it's no wonder that for over 30 years, prior to Ezra Levant's case in 2008, the commission had a 100% conviction rate. After years of hearings, lobbying, and battling politicians, Section 13 was finally repealed in 2013 on a federal level. But then, on a local level, Jacques Fremont, president of Quebec's Human Rights Commission, proposed Bill 59, which 
if passed, would have provided the human rights commissions with sweeping new powers to target those who wrote negatively about Islam, even on Facebook or their own websites. And because the human rights commissions don't adhere to the same procedures as criminal courts, it's easier for prosecutions to succeed in the human rights kangaroo courts. Had Bill 59 passed in its original form, its speech-stifling mission likely would not have been confined to Quebec, but would have spread to other provinces. Fortunately, the anti-speech provisions were eventually abandoned. But now, we see the proliferation of anti-Islamophobia motions throughout Canada and the West. So, what is Islamophobia? The term Islamophobia was co-opted by Muslim Brotherhood front groups to silence criticism of Islam. The aim of these motions is not just to shut down speech, but to additionally stifle debate on relevant policies, including border security, immigration, and national security, by shaming those who have opposing viewpoints. At its core, it's a thought-stopping measure. There are two main reasons that Islamists seek to censor this speech. One is to force Muslims to comply with Islamic blasphemy laws, and two is to create a safe space for jihadists and other Islamic supremacists to advance their goals free from scrutiny. In America, H.R. 569, to condemn anti-Muslim rhetoric, was co-sponsored by 145 out of 186 Democrats but went nowhere only because Republicans retained control. Similar motions and statements are popping up in local legislatures like the Quebec National Assembly, as well as interfaith groups, academia, and other societal institutions. Since crime statistics reveal that hate crimes are targeted primarily against Jews and blacks, how is it that Islamophobia is dominating public discourse? Islamists can't achieve their goals by, uh, by themselves. Against a backdrop of multiculturalism and political correctness, they rely heavily on their leftist allies to do their dirty work for them. Left-leaning politicians and the liberal elite in every sphere of society are knowingly or unwittingly aiding and abetting the cause of Islamic supremacy. It's the liberals and not the Islam Islamists who opposed repeal of Section 13. It's the liberals and not the Islamists who proposed Quebec Bill 59. And it's the liberals and not the Islamists who passed M103. It's also the liberals in government and the media who repeatedly omit from mention the jihadist motivations for the massacres of Fort Hood, Orlando, and San Bernardino. As the Muslim Brotherhood said, They'll destroy Western civilization from within using their hands, meaning the hands of the infidels, and the hands of believers, meaning Muslims. Let's look now at petition E411, upon which motion M103 was predicated. <coughs> E411 was initiated by the president of the Canadian Muslim Council and lauded by the National Council of Canadian Muslims, formerly known as Care Can, a Muslim Brotherhood front group. It asserts that terrorist activity in the name of Islam has been used as pretext for anti-Muslim sentiment, that the terrorists don't in any way represent the values or teachings of Islam, and in fact misrepresent the religion, and it claims in essence that Islam is a religion of peace, attempting to dissociate Islam from Islamic terrorism. This petition stands for the proposition that disagreement with its viewpoints constitutes Islamophobia. Its goal is to delegitimize opposing opinions, in including policy positions on border security, Muslim refugees, and Islamic terrorism. In short, petition E411 is a piece of Islamist propaganda and disinformation designed to undermine any political or legal efforts by Canadians to properly address the existential threat Canadians face from Islamic supremacy in all its forms. So, how will the language in M103 be construed? What are its implications? And is it cause for concern? 
M103, titled Systemic Racism and Religious Discrimination, was introduced into the House of Commons on December 5, 2016, by Liberal Party member Ikra Khalid. It passed on February 15, 2017, with all Liberal, NDR, and Green Party members voting for it, and all but two Conservative Party members voting against it. The text of the motion reads, in the opinion of the House, the government should recognize the need to quell the increasing climate of hate and fear, which you might have noticed are emotions, to condemn Islamophobia and all forms of, racist, uh, of systemic racism and religious discrimination, to take note of the issues raised in Petition E411, and request that the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage heritage undertake a study on how the government can develop a government approach to stamp out racism, religious discrimination, and Islamophobia, collect data to contextualize hate crime reports, and within eight months from passage of the motion, present recommended solutions. So what's wrong with M103? First, it singles out Islamophobia by name only. An alternative motion to additionally name Jews, Christians, Zeeks, and Hindus was beaten down by liberal MPs. Second, for clarity's sake, it was suggested that the word Islamophobia be replaced by anti-Muslim bigotry. But Khalid was unyielding and insisted on retaining that ill-defined term, Islamophobia. Why is that? The fact that this motion embraces Petition E411 is evidence that M103 is not merely addressing bigotry or discrimination against people. Rather, it constitutes a push to denounce specific ideas as Islamophobic, including beliefs, policies, and facts that run counter to the ideas expressed in E411. This motion also insinuates that Islamophobia is a form of racism. But what race is Islam? This notion turns the entire concept of anti-discrimination laws on its head, as these laws were forged on the premise that race is an immutable characteristic. And it applies also only to people, not to ideas or religions. Finally, contrary to what the media would have you believe, the fact that this motion is non-binding does not make it harmless or without consequence. It is a conditioned precedent to any binding law to create an environment where ideas contained in the laws are accepted by the public. Moreover, M103's mandate that Parliament provide recommended solutions for Islamophobia forebodes the implementation of government policy or binding legislation down the road. Make no mistake about it, M103 is the first step down the slippery slope of condemning, restricting, and ultimately outlawing speech that is considered offensive, especially Islamic blasphemy. With the rise of ISIS-inspired terror attacks in the West and the influx of Muslim refugees, we'll also witness an increase of anti-Islamophobia motions and conferences. This is no coincidence, but is designed to chill speech that addresses the critical issues of the day. We are in a war, but it is not a war on terror, for terrorism is only a tactic. We are in a war of ideas. It is Sharia totalitarianism versus freedom. It is outrageous that we in the West are taking advice from, collaborating with, and capitulating to the likes of the OIC, CARE, and the National Council of Canadian Muslims. We should not be afraid to assert that the Western values of freedom, human rights, and equality are superior to the Islamist values of tyranny, misogyny, religious apartheid, and blasphemy laws. The idea of multiculturalism is a failure. All cultures are not equal, all values are not equal, and all belief systems are not equal. In this war for the free world, freedom of speech is the battlefield upon which we will win or lose all other future freedoms. In the war of ideas, language is our weapon, and we shouldn't be disarming ourselves with censorship 
but should capitalize on all the words we have in our arsenal. Islamists and their leftist bedfellows keep talking about diversity, but clearly have no tolerance for diversity of opinion. The way to counter bad speech is with good speech, not by shutting down the debate. I'm sure that everyone here opposes race, gender, or religiously-based discrimination against people. But let's not confuse religious freedom with combating religious defamation. Religious freedom is the right of an individual to freely practice his faith. It is not the right of a religion to be free from criticism. There should be no idea, no policy, and no religion that is off the table for scrutiny and criticism where warranted. While jihadi attacks intensify around the globe, Islamists cry Islamophobia in order to claim victimhood and gain support for their anti-freedom measures. We cannot allow the OIC, the Canadian Muslim Forum, and the NCCM to take the shield of religious freedom and use it as a sword of state censorship. Benjamin Franklin said, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin with subduing the freeness of speech. Do not let them take one inch of it. Be vigilant and keep Canada free. Thank you very much. <laughs>